Hello and welcome to another edition of the American Racing Snobs. Eric Morse, Tony Rizzuti coming at you this week with a once in a decade cluster munch of a race, the German Grand Prix. We'll be talking about this one for years, Tony. Holy crap, what a race. Cluster munch. Yeah. I like that. Uh, it was everything you could have hoped for in a race in terms of unpredictability, changing conditions. Up was down, left was right. People were in the barriers left and right. Tony, it's first what, of all. It's what we asked for. It's exactly what this sport needed. It, we had that debacle yep. of the French Grand Prix, and since then, the last three races have been instant classics, and this might have been the most insane race since maybe Canada 2011 when Jensen Button went from last to first on, I think it was five pit stops. Yeah. We nearly saw that duplicated by Sebastian Vettel. Comes from dead last on the grid to finish second in a race that Ferrari could have, would have, and should have won if they didn't just completely fall apart in qualifying. If you'll remember last week, this was exactly what we asked for. We knew Mm -hmm. there was rain in the forecast. We knew FP1 and FP2 would not mean anything because it'd be super hot. And then three would start to cool off. And then where would we be for qualifying? Would it give the Ferraris the advantage? Or would it play back into Mercedes? And then on race day, we're going to get rain. But we didn't want just rain. We wanted, like, heavy rain, then no rain, then drying contingent, then rain again, then just... We got... So because it led to the smaller teams having the ability to strategize their way into the points. By going to slicks early and forcing other people to that, which created some mistakes for some people to get on the, we saw full wet. We saw just about every tire out there. Hamilton and it, and went out at one right. time on mediums, and they were never the right no, tire. No, but it but it brought everything into play, and it was perfect. It was perfect. I don't want every race to be no. like this, but you no. get one or two of these a year, and it really just energizes you and i'm sure it took the years off the end of the strategist's life up and down the pit lane it was a race for the ages if you haven't seen it turn this podcast off go watch it it's worth whoa the whoa two whoa and a half whoa, whoa let's not pa- get carried away pause it pause it all right actually okay. let, it, let it play to completion thank you watch the race and then just <laughs> listen to us again how about that then tell all your friends Exactly. So where where do we begin? Let, I let's start with qualifying. Ferrari. Yeah. What the crap? I don't know. They, How does this happen? They were so good once again. They were in such a great position. The two fastest cars are starting 20th and 10th. You know, what's funny was it starts with Vettel. Yeah, he doesn't even get out there because I think it was an intercooler. You're right. Yes, it was an intercooler, that it, which seemed to plague him in the race as well. We'll get to that later, but... He's not going to make it out in his home Grand Prix. What's going on? But but guess what? As sad as that is for Seb, Charles Leclerc is going to put the red car on the pole anyway. It looks great. It's fast. It's fast. We go out for Q3. Yeah, no. no. Broken. Broken. Fuel pump driver issue. <sighs> no, not going to make it out there. I mean, I, there, are time, there are times when I just think this is a cursed year for the boys in red. It's taken you this long to realize. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm just I, I'm being a smart ass. I but. gave up on it a long time ago, but it just, I thought I thought the reverse psychology would come into play, that if I finally admitted that the season is done and that this they're just a, a calamity of errors, that maybe it wouldn't happen just to suck me back in. No, 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 no. Nope. 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 So. Couldn't believe it. Charles Leclerc, despite that, still has a chance to win this race. And it's a driver error that ends his Grand Prix now. He wasn't the only one. To to be fair, to be fair, Hulkenberg's in that wall. Hamilton's in that Mm. wall. Kimi Raikkonen is off there. Carlos Sainz is off there. He's just the one unlucky enough to bury it all the way up to the axle there. I think Hulkenberg also didn't drive away. That track is so narrow, especially at the stadium section, that the... The grip, when you're in a changing condition like that, you saw if you're if you're two inches off the line, you're in the barriers, or you're at least on the skating rink there. Uh, I don't know what the solution is other well, than, hey, do we need a solution? I, yeah, I think we do. I want to talk about that section, but I do want to at least go on the record, because I know you're a Hulkenberg fan as well, that while it killed me that LeClaire did that, but it didn't surprise me, 
when Hulkenberg did it, it broke my heart because I really thought this was going to be the day that he finally breaks through. It was going to, I thought he was on for gets, about a fourth. I don't think he was going to get that know. podium with quick. the way Vettel was charging. No, you're right. I, I'm not sure that it was a guaranteed podium. But he, he would at least had it in his hands, and I hated that happened. Yeah. Back but, to that runoff area. So that, that part of the racetrack, and look, I'm with you. I think you and I are in agreement. If you go off the racing surface, there should be some kind of penalty. I think they need to right? put some sort of Do high Do you agree friction. with that regardless Absolutely. of the racetrack? If Don't you... change the racetrack. Change right. the runoff. And, and for Charles Leclerc, he had gone off there at least three times previously and realized there was no grip. Now, that particular section, stadium section as you called it, at that particular racetrack is the end of a drag strip or the beginning of the drag strip. I can't tell which it is, but there's a drag racing track that runs along there. If you've ever been to anything with drag racing, whether it's at the beginning or the end, those things leak oil and fluid. They blow up every other run. They you got can see sticky. how shiny it was compared to all the other asphalt around there. You knew there was no hope if you got the car on there. You were just on your own the car was on autopilot and people like Raikkonen and Hamilton were just lucky there was no difference in skill between what happened Hulkenberg and Leclerc 100 Lewis Hamilton that's it, just the roll of the dice and without the wet it's probably still a slippery area but enough to either put you just into the first part of the gravel trap or allow you to slide and catch it and drive back on the problem was when it was wet it became a huge safety factor I'm going to tell you why I'm concerned as you know, we always overreact on this thing. I'm going to give you a little overreaction, but I'm going to tell you why I'm going to overreact. The problem I had with that area of the racetrack was when Leclerc crashed, by the time he got done moping about the fact that he had crashed his car and he got out to walk, he's walking. He can't be 10 feet away from his car. The fans are all pointing and cheering because Hamilton has just gone off in the same area about 20 feet from where Leclerc was and crashed. Leclerc's clapping at them. He thinks the hands for him. He doesn't even realize that Hamilton's just gone right off. Like 20 feet from him. Had there been safety workers right there and that been, I mean, Charles, after the race, once he realized it, got very upset about it. Now, a lot of it you have to read into because that took him out of his race. But when you think about his godfather and what happened with Jules at at Japan, you can't have cars go whizzing off at other cars. I'm not saying it doesn't ha- it can't happen in the rain everywhere because it can. But they've definitely the next time we go there and there's weather a potential for weather, they're going to have to put something over that area to where you hit something else. I Racing is issue- inherently dangerous, but that. So they that could have been really car. bad. There was a safety yes. car thrown, and Hamilton still couldn't hang on to the car. I think the proper procedure should be virtual safety car immediately, followed by a proper safety car when needed. Throwing the actual safety car out, there's still an advantage to be gained by hurrying to pit road or being the first to be picked up because you still have that gap to get to pit lane if you so choose. So even though it's a safety car, you're not going slow like in NASCAR or IndyCar immediately. A virtual safety car will do that, and I think they need to look at that. Yeah. Uh, the Jules Bianchi situation in the wet at Suzuka several years ago, that was just a double-waved yellow. And the reason we have the virtual safety car was that. So why aren't we using it? They yeah. use it a couple times, Great but that's point. a situation where VSC button goes on immediately as soon as you see a driver in a vulnerable position. Yeah, you're exactly right. Again, a little bit of overreaction because racing is a dangerous sport, and and wet weather gave us an incredible race. It also gives you things that you just can't plan for. It's not like you can just suddenly go, okay, well, we're just going to extend the gravel trap because most of the times it doesn't make it, – there's plenty yeah. of gravel trap there. It, it's just one of those things. It's just we got we got a little bit lucky there. I think the procedure needs to change. Now, Leclerc wasn't the only – that wasn't the only time Leclerc was involved in something that was a safety issue yep. on the pit lane. He got a penalty for Ferrari, unsafe release during one of those times where everybody came down the pit lane. And right I think in it front was, of Grosjean, if I remember. Yeah, Grosjean had to jam on the brakes. Whereas Botas safely, his crew rightly held him after the Mercedes double stack so that he wouldn't come out into traffic. He barely hung on to second spot in front of Verstappen early on in the race. 
Where is the incentive if you can just pay a fine to not fire your car off whenever it makes sense? I'm with you 100%. It didn't hurt Leclerc on the racetrack one bit, and I was hopping mad, going, this is not safe, and you're not putting a proper deterrent out there. Ferrari has the deepest pockets out there. You think Mercedes is going to say, oh, Ferrari would take that every time. Yeah, they they would spend $100,000 to get two spots up the racetrack every single Grand Prix of the year. And it'd be a great buy. Yeah, that's a terrible, terrible precedent to set. The FIA stewards have not had a great year. Someone, I think it was Crofty or Brundle, argued that, well, it wasn't the driver doing it, it's the crew doing it. Why do you penalize the team? Exactly. Then why do we have pit stops? You win as a team, you lose as a team, and while it's not technically the driver's fault, that should be a penalty. There were two drivers who were penalized in this race who didn't do anything wrong from a driver's point of view. The two Alfa Romeo drivers had an issue with their clutch on the start that basically amounted to what the FIA described as traction control, gave them the equivalent of a stop-go penalty, which is the penalty for a jump start. And they got a 30-second, and there was nothing the driver could have done differently. That was a mechanical issue with the team. It's, Hamilton got a five-second penalty. You and I have talked about this before. We thought it was warranted for an unsafe pit entry because he had act, the basically yeah. entered on the other side of the bollock. But that wasn't <laughs> the bollock. Well, whatever it's called, bollard. <laughs> it, that means it's a totally very, different, isn't it? That's something very Come different. Come on, English fans. Send us a review and go, what are you talking about? Yeah, so he, bollard. I, I think Danny Ricardo is the one on the other side of the scrotum if yeah, we're going to take we you go. at face value there. But again, that wasn't in an attempt to, I mean, I guess in a way it was an attempt to, to cheat the rules a little bit, but the dude had no front wing. He's just trying to, his race was done at that point. It might it have would, been quicker for him to go around with how long it took him to get ready with the right tires and a front wing. I if just I thought it was sure really he was inc- going to crash again, I would have said just stay out. It seemed like inconsistent officiating. Yeah. On the Alpha thing, Alpha's going to appeal this. They say they have evidence to get Ooh, it don't completely. Appeal. I know nobody <laughs> wants it because your boy Kibitza got a point. Um, but they say that they had alerted while the, they were under safety car for forever at the beginning of the race because of the, the heavy rain, they had complained that they were having clutch issues. They they made it very known to the FIA that there's something wrong, and they were trying to figure out, can we come check it and renew our spot once we finally decide to start this race? And they were told no. So they feel like that they tried to say, we know we got an issue here, We'll see how it works out. I I don't see. I mean, to me, to overturn something, it has to be unbelievably in your favor. And I'm sorry if the limit is 70 milliseconds on your clutch reaction and your wheel traction, and you're at 200 and 300. You're not at like 73. You're at 200 and 300. And I know that's not much time. That's but especially in the wet, any advantage triple. is a huge advantage. Well, you saw it. Kimi Raikkonen had a blinding start. Yeah, and I'm like. Does- it almost looked like he had traction control. Go go figure, he did. He ended up in third on the start, whereas Max Verstappen qualified second, just like in Austria, went backwards at the start, just like in Austria, and ended up winning the race, just like, uh, where was that? Austria. Uh, two of the most exciting races of the season. Max Verstappen, did you see the troll job that Honda did on Twitter after this? No. That's GP2 wins for Honda engines this year, trolling Fernando Alonso, who famously said on the radio at Japan, Honda's home race, that it felt like a GP2 engine. Wow. Nice. That's uh, two for Honda, zero for Fernando uh, on the 2019 calendar so far. Great win for Max, and we mentioned it. If there was rain, we felt like the two best drivers in the field in the rain would be Hamilton and Verstappen. Hamilton had his problem. Verstappen it had wasn't his like problem. Max didn't have his. I was just going to yeah. say, it wasn't like he didn't have his, but he ends up winning the race. That was great for Red Bull. Vettel, I, he comes from 20th instantly up to like 8th. Then he just hovers in like 8th or ninth, and they start talking about he's having this turbo issue or intercooler. I don't think it was the inter. Well, it could have been the intercooler. He's having some type of issue. He's kind of stalled. And for half the race, he just kind of sat there, and you figure, well, that's as fast as he's going to go. And then once we went green again after the final safety car, he just blew by people, especially in DRS zones. I had people going, it was almost like those smaller teams just pulled over and let him go. And I'm like, no, they're just that much faster. Yeah, I thought Vettel was the coolest cat on the racetrack in Hockenheim. He was, I think, the only one who I didn't see put a wheel wrong. Yeah. 
Uh, he absolutely deserved that. And could well, after this be, last year, he was probably yeah. ultra careful. Could this be the building block that returns Sebastian Vettel to former glory? We'll see. He had a grin on his face at the end of the race like he had stole every kid's candy. Well-earned. Well-earned drive from Seb. Max, uh, like, like I said, he had his problems, but he was the best driver with that kind of pace. I mean, it helps when you got a, a huge advantage over someone like Vettel at the start where Vettel was on a recovery drive the entire time. Verstappen was putting pressure on the Mercedes. I do think that Mercedes could have won this race if things went differently, but this was it was a game of shoots and ladders. I think that's what Hamilton said afterwards. You just didn't know how the rain was going to affect your tire selection, and it just completely reset the race four or five different times. I thought the strategy call of the race goes yeah. to racing point with Lance Stroll. Because Lance Stroll ends up in the fourth position, very nearly got his second podium of his career. You have to go back to Baku and the Williams a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but Lance Stroll put in a great drive in that strategy call, getting him on the slicks while the safety car was still out, because I was hoping Hamilton would do that. He could have served his five-second penalty, and then, yeah, it's a risk because you don't know if the track's going to dry out. Hamilton was on the radio asking, do we need to get off these tires during that safety car? Uh, it's hard to say what would have happened because obviously that Mercedes was damaged when Hamilton went off the track. So it's easy to say, hey, he would have walked that race with a free pit stop, getting on the right tire, putting heat in it while everyone else is still on the, the intermediates. He would have come out ahead of Verstappen and Vettel for sure. Would he have stayed there? I don't know. I don't understand why they wouldn't want to serve that penalty during that safety car, though, but Give it up for Racing Point. They got it right. Lance Stroll finishes fourth. I'm going to take credit for that because he ended up on my cover of F1 2019. How of in all the, world the covers did that in the happen? world, I get the Canadian version <laughs> with Lewis Hamilton and Lance Stroll. The minute I looked at it, I'm like, the, the hell? hell is this? I got a counterfeit thing. Then I flipped it over and saw that the entire back was in French. And I'm like, oh, they pulled this from the Canadian stock. I probably have a collector's item. Yeah, they I'm, probably didn't sell too many of those. I'm going to order the Polish version. Uh, for Mercedes, yeah, we talk about the rough day. They were they were in position to to make this a complete weekend and an even tougher weekend with them celebrating the 200th race, 125 years. They had on the classic clothing, which I thought was really cool looking. Oh, by the way, Netflix was following them that weekend. Oh, I can't so, wait for that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so... Toto was asked afterwards, was it just too much? I mean, kind of goofing around with the clothes and the funky livery and you had the TV people where you guys just not focused. And at first he commented on Sky that, you know, they're a little bit superstitious and maybe they pushed it a little bit far. But then he was asked afterwards about that comment. And he goes, look, it's not Netflix fault. It's not the celebrations fault. It's not the livery's fault. The race just didn't go fault. our way. Blame it on the rain. Millie Vanilli. It just, it just happens, and we'll get better from it. So, yeah, that'll be a treat for us next year when Mercedes comes up for their episode and everything looks so perfect for them, and then it all goes slip sliding away. So Valtteri Botas, to me, had the most to lose. They said he was driving for his seat. And he lost it. He lost the car when he's got a clear podium where Lewis Hamilton doesn't look like he's going to score points, that was his chance. He's now 41 points back in an equal car. Hamilton, despite only finishing ninth after those penalties, is still the driver that gets tougher and tougher and tougher as the season goes on. I thought Botas had a real shot to make things interesting and close that gap, and instead he threw it in the tire barrier. Speaking of somebody who, if not made a seat hotter for somebody else, certainly made it look really good for him, Danny Kafiat finishing third, Second getting a career podium. podium for Toro Rosso. Those guys were going bananas. And with all the pressure that's been talked about Gasly and him needing a good weekend, he didn't have it. He destroyed a car Whoops! earlier in the week. A crash that Nico Rosberg claimed on his podcast was a half a million dollar crash when you take into account what happened to the car and what can happen to his career just in one shunt. And then he runs in the back of the sister car yep. of Alex Albon, 
with points on the line. Yep. And it, he was right there and just drove in the back of him. And then Kafia goes and puts the car on the podium. And Albon had a great drive, too. Tough days and a tough weekend for Gasly. Now, Red Bull Motorsports director or his, their advisor, Dr. Helmut Marco, came out and he says, let me make this clear. We are committed to Gasly for the entire season. We're not going to pull him mid-season. The follow-up question was, but is Kvyat putting a lot of pressure on that seat? And he said, absolutely. Reheat up the leftovers. Mm. Here comes Danny Kvyat. How many times has he been announced by Red Bull? How many? Yeah. So he went to Toro Rosso. Then they promoted him to Red Bull. Yep. uh, When I think that was when Vettel left, he partnered Ricardo. So that's two press conferences introducing Kvyat. (laughs) Then they move Verstappen into his seat, put him back to Toro Rosso. That's three. Then he loses his ride. Yep. Comes back. So that's four driver announcement Uh press conferences uh, with Red Bull on the banner for. One driver in one series. I mean, that's that's just living a life, isn't it? Oh. But he stepped up when he needed to. If he if his goal is to get back in that car, which it would be, you'd want to be in the parent car as opposed to the sister car. Uh, he certainly did a great job. And you mentioned, and I'm going to let you say it. Told you so. You said Hamilton. If something goes weird, I like Verstappen, and my midfield MVP. Hmm. I like Albon. What? Albon had a good. He had a good race. He was sixth. Finished sixth. Uh, I think. Kofi How'd you pull got, that off? Uh, Albon. Well, if you recall, I wanted Raikkonen, but you took him. I so did. I was being contrary. So it, I took it was Leclerc a bit of, and Kimi, and both backfired on me. It was Kimi a, had a, a good lucky race. pick. It was a lucky pick. Uh, Kimi ends up twelfth after the thirty-second penalty, but he started times up there. He was fighting with the Ferraris. Yep. He was third after the start, uh, and. Yeah, he had his offs, but I think almost everybody had an off. So no, no offense to Kimi Räikkönen there, but Albon, six place points. Yep. How about this? There were two Hondas on the podium. You I, know when the last time that happened was? <laughs> Nineteen. It had to be in the nineties. Yeah. Ninety two with Senna, and I think it was Gerhard Berger. Uh, unbelievable. unbelievable. I would say, race. how does Zach Brown feel about that decision now? But Science was fifth. And Norris had a good car. He just ended up... Oh, Norris broke. The two people I feel the worst for in this race because they didn't get a chance to shine was Danny Ricardo, who went kablamo. Mm -hmm. Renault's having a tough week. We'll come back to that. Uh, And Lando Norris, who lost power. There was an opportunity to steal a podium, and they didn't get to race for it. Now, who knows how this this crazy game of dice was going to come out for them. Uh, I Seriously, for my nerds out there, it was like... Uh, pit for slicks. I don't know. Roll D20. We'll see what your dungeon master says if you can pit for slicks now. <laughs> nope, nope. Uh, roll for deception. Uh, you're in the barrier. Anyway, uh, those two drivers got the shortest of sticks. Yeah, uh, they did. Perez was the first one out. He crashed. That's of his own doing. I have less sympathy when when it's a driver error, although there were loads and loads There's of driver errors out there. Plenty of tell-sell money there. Let's talk about Williams in the points. They may have gotten a point. We, Currently, they have a point. Kubica is no longer pointless. I'll have to look this up. Is that I, the first race he beat Russell as well? Not the first race that he's beat him in. He hasn't beaten him qualifying. In fact, uh, Russell has clinched the season head-to-head qualifying one race after halfway against Kubica. But I do believe he finished ahead of him uh, through some uh, some pit work or something like that earlier in the Robert season. Robert should just retire. Yeah, uh, He Kubica got his beat point, I'd just France. walk away. I'd be like, see y'all. Somebody else drive this bucket of bolts. Uh, finish the season. He'll finish the season. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm he'll be back. Here. But I, I, all I wanted this year, when I saw how bad the Williams was in preseason testing, I was like, just get Kubica a point. And I tried to look up this record. I don't know what the record is. Most time elapsed in between points finishes. It has got to be a new record for Robert Kubica to get into 10th with that post-race penalty. By the way, those penalties get Hamilton up to ninth, keep his point scoring streak alive, even though it's only worth two points. Um, that's something to keep an eye on. But Kubica, to me, that's one of the biggest stories coming out of this race weekend is Ferrari's implosion, Kubica earning a point, and what do we do with Haas? I've told you what we need to do with Haas. I think you've changed my mind. Gut it. I think you've changed my or, mind. How on earth do they run into each other again? 
because that's what they're going to do. They don't like each other, and they're not listening. So they have to do one or two things over at Haas. They either need to scrap it and bring a whole new driver lineup, and these guys haven't necessarily lit the world on fire. So I'm not against them doing that. In fact, I would propose that that's what they do. Or they just need to come out and go, here's the deal, fellas. This car is number one. This car is number two. And when we come across the radio and say, you need to back it off, you're going to back it off. And just team orders. That's the deal. You will not pass this car, so don't even get near him. That That's their only two choices at this point because they're obviously not listening. But again, there's nothing about Grosjean or Magnussen that make me excited for 2020, but I'd be more excited about Ocon and somebody else. You may have just convinced me because I didn't want to blow it up. I, I appreciate the speed and talent of both of these drivers, even though sometimes Grosjean can come off like a head case. And after all that happened at Silverstone, for them to go out there and bang wheels with a double points finish on the line, could you imagine where Gunter's ears would have landed if they had taken each other out of a double points finish. I, look, We'd still be searching. They got lucky for his again headset. like they did in Spain. And and Gunter is not he is well known. It's not even just his persona on television. He is well known within the garage area of being a I take no shit kind of guy. People are in fear of that man in the way he can come across and he's had to do it three times, and they still won't listen. This is one of those irreconcilable differences, and they're not going to ever be able to race with each other. Here were the quotes on the radio. Grosjean, this guy never learns, right? It's all Magnuson's fault. Magnuson, do whatever you want, but I can't race with this guy. Like, they have made it clear. Who, who was on the inside of the hairpin? I, there Magnuson. was so much to, to process in this race. Magnuson was on the inside. It's Magnuson's corner, but when you're racing. It your, was a late dive. Uh, but it was to the outside. You expect when you're racing your teammate and you go to the outside that they're going to do everything they can to not run into you. You're not going to get the position probably that way, but you're going to have good momentum coming out of that corner. Racing your teammate is supposed to be different. So if Magnuson is covering the inside and a Ferrari goes to the outside or a Toro Rosso or a Williams goes to the outside, you expect him to push out and take that racing line away. If you know it's your teammate and he knows, you can't do that. You can't. I put Magnuson slightly more at fault in this, not knowing what was said to Grosjean. Grosjean says, we weren't told that we can't race each other. We were told we can't crash into each other. I thought... Grosjean, well, they didn't race each yeah. other. They Grosjean's, crashed into each other. Grosjean's move was fair to me, but they didn't race each other like teammates. And at this point, I, I can't even blame one over the other anymore. It's a systematic problem, and they've got to do something. They have to. Whether that's team orders or clean house, I think... it. it I obviously don't have the experience that Gunter Steiner does, and I don't work with these people every day. But if it was my team, I'd say whoever qualifies highest, you're the number one driver. You don't get passed unless we have a significant tire strategy gap between the two. I think that's two. what they have to do. The re- they're going to just have to declare a one and a two, and that's the way it and is. And that can change each week. And if the number two doesn't like it, the number two can go walk. Mm-hmm. And neither one of them are going to go walk. I think it's time. It's Look, it's time. I I, I think Grosjean wasn't convinced after Silverstone, and now y- you have to do something. I want to root for this team. I really do. I like Gene Haas. I like the people on the NASCAR side. I like the fact that there's at least a pseudo American entry in there, even though they're not American drivers, and the team's still based over in in Europe as opposed to just up the street in Canapolis. But here's my deal. I have all the respect for Roman Grosjean as a race car driver. I think he's a good race car driver. I don't think he's a future champion in any car because I think he's too big a head case. That's just my opinion from the outside looking in. I agree with you on Kevin Magnuson. I think at times Magnuson shows that he has a whole lot of speed. He also shows that he can be incredibly careless. People don't like to race against him because he's crazy. Right now, Max was that way early on, but it didn't take Max long to realize who I can race, who I can't. I can give a little bit of space, but I can still make moves. 
and people have learned to respect him. I don't think they're ever going to learn to respect Magnuson. I don't see him as a future champion now. I don't see Haas ever as a future champion, but you never know in Formula One. If nobody Ron GP nobody <laughs> thought 50 years ago or 40 years ago Williams could be a Formula One championship team and we're one of the greatest ever. You just never know. But I just don't, there's not enough there that's worth turning my factory, my team, my sponsors, my public opinion so upside down than these two yahoos. They're, they're not good enough to put up with it. They're just not. It's my it's my take, my hot take. Agreed. Rarely rarely are we in agreement, but uh, third time, strike three, you're out. Team orders, let's do this. And if you can't do that, then it's time to start changing drivers. Yep. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about, sure. F1. Uh, my brother-in-law had the line of the race. We were watching this up in Pocono uh, together before the NASCAR event this weekend. And uh, he said... I'm not crying, it's raining in my helmet. Who do you give the I'm not crying, it's raining in my helmet award to for this week? Who who garners the most sympathy for you? I, I think my two nominees are Leclerc Hulkenberg. or Hulkenberg. Who do you feel worse for? Uh, That's a tough one, isn't it? Or We can also throw George Russell in there because he was almost in the points. So I want to say Hulkenberg because I think he needed it more than anybody. I think this could have been, even despite how it was all going to turn out and why he was in position, it was something his career really needed to extend it because he's another one of those guys that people are starting to look at and go, we've given him a lot of time. But now that I think about it, I think it's Leclerc because I think Leclerc had a winning car and Ferrari so desperately needs a winning car. If he... Like and, and he should so have close. known. He ran off there three straight times. Like, if anything, I'd have gone through that corner and lost time. Uh, to right? me, I'm going to Hulkenberg because I think Leclerc is going to be in position to win a race soon. I would have thought he'd have won one by now. Yeah. There's no guarantees. And Hulkenberg, that was to sniff the podium with the dual economy we see in Formula One right now with the haves and the have-nots. Anytime a midfielder can sniff a podium, and huge congrats to Danny Kafiat for actually pulling it off and for Stroll for coming as close as he did. But for a Renault to finish on the podium, those opportunities are going to be few and far between. And Hulkenberg, we've documented the longest career in Formula One without a podium finish. And it was, I'm not going to say it was a done deal, but it was there. It was within earshot and just feel terrible for him. Tony, I think we're going to take a quick little break here. You got anything else for the Grand Prix you want to get through? No, not this one. When we come back from the break, we'll do the Morse code report, and then we will give you our picks. We're racing this weekend again. We're in Hungary. Oh, crap. We are. So we, we got to come up with some picks, so we'll do that. Stand right? up if I'm going to pull that out of my ass. <laughs> we'll do that right after this. Here's your chance to win a set of your very own Hercules tires. Go to HerculesTires.com slash MRN. Simply register, and each month we'll give away one set of tires. Hercules Tires has the value, selection, and industry-leading mileage coverage to get you wherever you need to go, no matter where the road takes you. Register now for your chance to win a set of Hercules Tires at HerculesTires.com slash MRN. Hercules Tires, ride on our street. Welcome back to American Racing Snobs. It's now time to learn about the other series that we're racing over the weekend. It's Eric Morse with the Morse Code Report. Well, Tony, just up the road from where the Formula One cars were racing in Hockenheim is a little track we call Spa Francorchamps. And they had their 24-hour endurance race. You were geeked about this. Oh, they were, they were under the same weather gremlins as the Formula One crowd was. It was an absolutely maniacal race in terms of how they had to deal with the conditions. Spa is like the Nürburgring at night. There is no natural light. Mm. They're racing through the Belgian countryside, blasting up Eau Rouge through Ratty onto Lake Home with torrential downpours. They actually had to stop the race in the overnight for, I think it was five and a half hours on a red flag because of how bad the weather got. And the race recap, uh, our, our good friend Bob Varsha actually was, uh, I think, on the the B crew. He was the second play-by-play, the second shift play-by-play announcer for this. I felt so badly for him and his 
broadcast team, when they would do the race recap, it would take damn near eight minutes because there was so much action and carnage in this race. Definitely worth looking up the highlights on YouTube. Uh, The upshot, it was a Porsche afternoon. Kevin Estra Mm -hmm. had a fantastic first drive slashing through the field. It came down to the final half hour. There were two full-course safety cars, and Kevin Estra was able to beat Nick Tandy across the line by just over three seconds in a 24-hour race. Uh, It's GPX Racing Porsche 911, co-driven by Richard Leitz and Michael Christensen getting the victory. It was hard-earned. By the way, you mentioned the weather, not to go back to Germany, but uh, Kubica said that the the spray and the darkness when the heavy rain came was worse than driving in the dark fog of a rally car. And he'd know something about that because that's what he was doing yep. when he got injured that nearly ended his driving career back in his Renault days. So, yeah, it was it was a tough... The I kept looking up the radar picture because we... We were geeking out about what kind of race is this going to be. We knew it was going to cool off. But in terms of just the giant weather system that was hovering over the Benelux countries, uh, the central France, and into Germany was just wreaking havoc. Between the Saturday the rain and was Sunday. nuts, right? Yeah, it made for some real interesting races. Yeah, I think even the Tour de France had to be canceled or postponed or rerouted because of hail and all sorts of crazy just the weather over there has been crazy the last two weeks it's crazy everywhere i yeah, think we is. broke the planet so <laughs> we, we uh, definitely did it's partly our fault us uh gasoline consuming petrol heads here uh so uh you mentioned tour de france did you see any of mid ohio because they put joseph newgarden in a yellow jersey since he's the points leader in the indy car series and I think that pressure might have gotten to him because Joe New had an absolute bonehead move on the last lap of the race, running in the fourth position in front of his championship rival, Alexander Rossi, and he just dive bombs Ryan Hunter Ray going into the keyhole on the last lap, spins the car out, beaches it, does not finish. He was looking to pick up a bunch of points That's on Alex zero Rossi. That's hero or zero right there, isn't it? It was... It was beyond stupid. I don't think he was going to make the hero part. That's the problem with Joseph it. Newgarden's a champion. He always seems to be under control, calm, cool, and collected. He's not known as a risk taker. This might come back to haunt him because instead of having a healthy point lead, he's only got 16 points now over Alex Rossi. Simon Pagino's 47 back, and don't look, here comes Scott Dixon 67 points back. And, Tony, we got double points at the end of the year. Death, so we got taxes, what? and Scott Dixon. Two, and the Freedom 100. That's true, the Freedom 100. Thank uh, you. We got two ovals left. We got Pocono and Gateway. Then we've got Portland and the double points on the line at Laguna Seca. I think any of those top four, if they get hot, could run away with this. But Joseph Newgarden, he's a champion for a small lapse of reason, didn't drive like one on the final lap. Uh Scott Dixon, meanwhile, great strategy by the Ganassi boys to get Dixon out in front. Felix Rosenquist was all over him. He needed maybe two more run. corners to get around him to get his first career win. Instead, it's Scott Dixon, as we mentioned, creeping back into the championship picture with his second victory of the season. Other big news out of mid-Ohio, new contract for Alexander Rossi with Andretti Auto it was Sport worth a shot. and Honda. It was worth a shot. I like stirring it up. Oh, So, so does Robin Miller. <laughs> That's all he could talk about for the last few months. What's he going to do now? Not sure I wanted to be compared there, but whatever. Well, if the shoe fits. That's right. Also at Mid-Ohio, Indy Lights, Oliver Askew, our Freedom 100 winner yep. from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway earlier this year, swept the weekend in the Indy Lights series. He now has a 45-point lead over Rhinus VK with five races remaining. They'll be at Gateway, and then they have double headers at Portland and Laguna Seca. I thought it was Rikus VK. Uh, it could be. That's my I, new beer drinking name. Remember, that's what I yeah. When I see people at the bar, I can't remember if it's Rhinus or Rinkus. I sound I sound unprepared. Maybe it's his brother Rhinus. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first typo on my sheet here. So this thing is covered with red squiggly lines, and I'm pretty sure they don't mean keep going. You're doing awesome, <laughs> uh, Tony. Australian supercars, yes. fun series, right? Yes. No, Kenny. that's Kenny. They series. have outlawed fun. What are you in talking the Australian about? Australian supercar Come on, series. T- talk to me. $3,000 fine to Scott McLaughlin for doing a celebratory burnout. 
Oh, come on. $10,000 fine to Scott McLaughlin for bringing a fake newspaper onto the podium that said Ford Mustang clinches constructors championship. Oh, come on. Where is the fun? Uh, this was in Ipswich in race number two. I'm, I know I'm going out of order here. And that was when Scott McLaughlin held off the Holden of Shane Van Ginsbergen for his 14th win of the season. He's now in kicking distance of the record set by Craig Lowndes. He had 16 wins back in 1996. By the way, there are 10 races left on the calendar for DJR Team Penske, Scott McLaughlin, to annihilate that record. Next thing you're going to tell me, you can't bring your dingo to Phillips Island. What is going on? I heard they don't drink Foster's at Bathurst. So. Now, I was told Foster's is horrible beer by our truck driver who's Australian. He says it's the worst beer in Australia. I don't drink beer, but I would trust him on his opinion. Yeah, on I used that. to get those big oil cans all the time. I thought they were great. <laughs> uh, rewinding to race number one in Ipswich, Jamie Wincup ended the longest winless streak of his Triple Eight career. Remember, he joined them in 2006. 24 races since his most recent victory ends that drought. Record extending 114th career win. Wow. For Mr. Jamie Wincup. Wow. Uh, we got some racing coming up this weekend. Besides the Hungarian Grand Prix, we will have IMSA at Road America. There is nothing quite like sports cars when they go to central Wisconsin there. That is a great track and car pairing right there so make sure you check that out i believe that's going down on sunday on nbc but the hungarian grand prix tony what you got well real quick did you check out mick schumacher driving his dad's f2004 that took that was awesome that took some bollocks tony he was on the right side there of the bollocks go. there there we go uh because that's an old high downforce car high horsepower car if you don't go fast in those you can't go at all there's only one speed on those cars because if you don't attack the corner, you don't make enough downforce to stick to the track. So that was that was more than just a little parade wave demo lap. That was awesome. And I, I got to tell you this. I've gotten used to the sound of the turbo hybrids. Mm -hmm. I really have. I'd kind of forgotten until I saw that car out there and heard that beautiful sound. And I was like, 19,000 oh, RPM shriek from a V10. God, I missed that. That was so cool. But a, a cool thing to him, he said it was torture waiting to drive that car because he was so excited, and it meant so much to him. So that was a really cool moment for Mick. All right, let's talk some Hungry Grand Prix, shall we? Let's do this. I can't remember who went first last week. I think you went first because I seem I took to recall Raikkonen. wanting uh, the Kimster. All right, I'll let you go first. Who do you like as your winter? Win winter. Who do you like as your winner in Hungary? I think it will be a Mercedes 1-2. I think it will be Hamilton, but I would be prepared for Botas to come back with a vengeance. They have said that they will decide after the break the fate of Valtteri Botas weighing the pros and cons of the Finnish driver versus Esteban Ocon. What more does the guy have to do? I mean, it's not like he's paired up with one of the greatest, may go down as the greatest of all time. What's the guy supposed to do? It, it's a tough situation yes, if you're Toto Wolf. You don't know what the right call is. I think Botas has driven well enough to keep his job. He's got one more shot before the summer shutdown to really leave them with a the taste in their mouth. I think they've already decided, and I think it's a marketing deal. We'll see. I think it'll come down to Hamilton or Botas. I checked the weather. Yep. It's supposed to be mid-70s in the I don't Hungary. like that. As a Ferrari guy, I don't like that. We need no. it back up in the hundreds. Yeah, that's the only— Come I, on, a heat wave? Yeah, I think either a heat wave or a high-horsepower track like Monza or Spa, that's yeah, your only that's chance. I think those are your last two chances I unless agree. there's some unseasonable warmth somewhere else. Uh, I'll see. tell you what, not, if you told me right now that Vettel's going to win at, at Monza, I'd book the ticket right now. I would. I get on an airplane. I'd pay the money, a ridiculously expensive trip to go to because Italy's not cheap. But I would go to see that. I th they'll tear those grandstands down. I think he could do it. I think a red car could very well win Monza. A v red car very well could win Spa. But I've seen them get in their way so many times. Yeah. You you've been hurt too many times, Tony. I know. To 
but I'd, I'd give it a shot if I knew it was going to happen. Who do you like for your midfield MVP? I'm looking at Danny Ricardo. There is a black cr- cloud over Reno right now. I, did you see that their one of their transporters crashed? I did. On the way to the Hungaro ring, it went across the median, across another lane of highway, and into the woods like a Formula One rig just sticking out of the woods. Uh, the driver has been hospitalized with minor injuries. I don't know if they were hauling race cars, hospitality, uh, sh- like their their that, massive transformer. Those things are so cool! Oh, it's they're unbelievable. When you go in one, you you can't believe that this fits in a truck. Yeah. Uh, or if it was engines, since they're an engine supplier as well. Uh, they have not released uh, the contents of that truck. Hopefully it won't put them behind anymore, but this is historically a good track for Daniel Ricciardo. Uh, I believe he won there back in 2014 for Red Bull. After that mechanical failure, I think he's due for some good karma after the engine went kablamo in Hockenheim. All right, I'm going to go with Hamilton as well to win. My bogey, in case something crazy happens to him, is going to be Sebastian Vettel. You think that mojo is going to carry over? I think maybe. Look, when they got to qualifying, it wasn't super hot conditions. It was a normal summer day in Europe, and they were still fast. Now, they had the problem, but remember, we came out of Silverstone saying that they had realized, looking at the data, they had discovered some things they thought were going to help that car from a setup standpoint, and I think they found them. Um, So I'll go Vettel just on the bogey thing, but I think it's a Hamilton race. I don't know if you're going to give me this for – MV, uh, midfield MVP. I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to say my MVP of the midfield is Pierre Gasly. Are you going to give that to me? Let's define the parameters. Finishing in front of the midfielders doesn't impress me. I don't think a he's, Red Bull guy's a midfielder, but considering the position he's in and as poorly as he's driven, he's been a midfielder. If he just beats the rest of the midfield, I wouldn't give that to you. If he goes up there and mixes it up with a red car or a blue car, or a silver car, then absolutely, I will give you... If you think it's a good weekend for Pierre Gasly, that's what he's got to do. I think this... I think he know. I think he really knows he's got to have a good one this weekend. I don't think he's going to go in with a bunch of super pressure, though. I think he's going to go in going, I just need to be me. I'm going to drive the heck out of this race car. He was sixth last year in the Toro Rosso here, so he gets around the track pretty well. Red Bull seems to have found their pace. They have great handling... So I'm going to go with him. I know it's a bit of a controversial pick, but given what he's been doing lately, I, I'm telling you, Signs is more of a yeah. given. Signs is more chalk than Gasly at this point. Yeah. It, if that Red Bull of Gasly's gets up there among the other top five and mixes it up, then I'll give that to you. So next week we get ready for the Hungry Grand Prix. We'll have all the action here. I'm actually on vacation, so we'll figure something out, whether I call in or maybe Kenny Kenny will jump in. He'll talk V8 supercars, so he'll let you know if there's fun or not. Oh, yeah. That yeah. guy knows it all. Absolutely, and he uh, he is well-learned. So if you decide uh, you're going to— I'll send you some notes if I can't make it. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you're just chilling on I'm going to be on a yatchet. A, 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 one of those ones that you see in a Monaco? Yes, Quite a bit smaller and sitting in South Carolina. But, you know, when in Rome, hey, Redneck Riviera. There are no racetracks in Charleston, South Carolina. No, there's not. And I don't know that I'm going to have television. I'm damn sure going to find internet. I'll find some place. I'll, I'll spare a thought for you. Here, just take your yacht, find a Starbucks that's on the coast, and just try to bogey, bogart their Wi-Fi that's there. That's exactly what yeah, I'm going to do. do that. Should be a lot of fun. All right, that's going to do it for us. For Eric Morse, I'm Tony Rizzuti. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you again on another episode of American Racing Snobs.